Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidil Mursaleen Muhammadin al-Ameen amma ba'd. Today, inshallah, I want to explain the difference between black magic and Kabbalah magic. You see, <coughs> black magic, in short, is when you use the jinns to get something you want. And the difference between a jinn and a shaitan is that a jinn that swears allegiance to Iblis as to be the enemy of human beings. He's a shaitan. So the jinn, not all jinns are shaitan, but every shaitan in the jinn world is a jinn because shaitan can be amongst human beings too. So that jinn that swears allegiance to Iblis and his army and his tribes that I will be an enemy to a human being, he becomes shaitan. Black magic is magic that can use any jinns. They may be jealous of human beings, they may not feel anything human towards human beings, but they will come to an alliance with a magician to hurt a human being for their own benefit, not out of uh, spite against human beings necessarily. A Kabbalah is a form of magic that comes in the garb of spirituality and it comes in the garb of certain shayateen, certain shayateen acting as specifically as angels. And they act as angels and they affect uh, they act as angels. Now, why do they act as angels? Let me give you the history of this. You see, in the time of Sulaiman wasalam, there was so much magic that it was hard to tell <coughs> if this person's doing this for angelic reasons, meaning he's a prophet of Allah, or if a person is doing this because of a jinn. It became hard. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down two angels to teach the people a knowledge that would help them distinguish between angelic work versus a jinn work. But this became like a knife that could be used for good or could be used for bad. And of course many people started using it for bad. Because now they were able to tell which is the angels and which is the jinn. And they were able to establish the relationships with the jinns and ha have the jinns do work for them. That was very, very bad. And so now uh, a time period had to come where a prophet would come that would control all the jinns. And that was Prophet Sulaiman because it had become very confusing for the Muslims in Babylon at that time. And the Muslims in Babylon at that time were the Jews in Babylonia. And uh, everything became mixed, the good and the bad. And so the angels came to teach them this is the good and this is the bad. And this is how you know this is a true prophet. And this is how you know this is a false prophet. But instead of doing right, they did wrong. But in this garb, Okay, in this garb, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically mentions he sent down angels? Because, you see, in Kabbalah, they teach you that you're getting in touch with the angels. You, they teach you that you are getting in touch with the angels. But in fact, you're only getting in touch with shayateen. Now, having said this, let's go over these verses, this one verse of the Qur'an. And then after that, we'll talk about the effect of Kabbalah on Hollywood and what is the link. Because, you see, Kabbalah is magic that is specific to certain aims and goals. And the aims and the goals of Kabbalah have to do with the coming of the Masih. See, even the Dajjal at the time of the Prophet was talking about his coming out. For those of you who know the narrations, he is always talking about his coming out. And so the Kabbalah is the magic that has to do with the shayateen who pretend to be angels in the garb of spirituality. And the real intent is to bring the Messiah. Okay, 
Now having said this, let us look at this verse in the Quran. What a beautiful verse this is of history. Like no man in the desert وسلم, could have said this. The only one who could have said this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَطْلُوا الشَّيَاطِينُ عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ And they followed. What? The people, the Jews. They followed. What was recited to them. And by the way, I want to make one point that's very interesting here. This passage uh, talking about the Jews is specifically talking about the Jews in Medina. And it ends with this verse. Okay. So let me just uh, show you quickly just so that we're on the same page this uh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions awakullam in ayah number 100 awakullama ahadu ahdan nabadha fariqan minhum every time they made a you know they is it not allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and i'll give you the english translation is it not that whenever we made a covenant with them they would break the covenant but aktharahum la yu'minun most of them will not believe walamma jaam rasul min indillahi musaddiqan lima ma'ahum nabadha fariqu min alladhina utu alkitaba kitab allah wa ra'a dhuhurihim and this part is talking about the Jews of Medina. That whenever a messenger came, confirming that which had already come before, right? A group of them would throw the book of Allah back that had the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, And uh, they would pretend like as if they don't know their own book. And then uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about specifically Jibra'il alayhi salatu wasalam talking about the Jews of Medina because they asked Prophet Muhammad which is the Prophet that comes to you and he said it's Jibra'il and as you know the main angel the archangel the primary angel in the Jewish literature is Mikail of course he's the the, the angel of risk and money and providence so so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 98 says man kana aduwwa lillahi wa malaikati wa rusuli wa jibril whoever is an enemy of Allah Allah his angels his messengers and jibril wa mikail fa inna Allah aduwwa lil kafirin and Allah is an enemy to the people who disbelieve and then in the ayah before that in ayah 97 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says man kana aduwwa lil jibril specifically to that question that i mentioned right fa inna hu nazzala ala qalbik for he is the one who has sent it down on your heart Okay, specifically talking to the Jews of Medina. Bi'idhnillah, by the permission of Allah. Musaddiqan lima bayna yaday. Confirming that which is which is already with you. Hudan wa bushra lil mu'mineen. It is a guidance and a good news for those people who believe. And if you keep going up this uh, passage, right, you'll find that it's talking to the Jews of Medina specifically. So the Jews of Medina uh, were not just practicing black magic. They were following Kabbalah magic. Okay, and I'm going to make this a little bit more clear. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّبَعُوا مَا تَطْلُوا الشَّيَاطِنُوا عَلَى مُلْكِ سُلَيْمَانِ And they followed, meaning the Jewish community, their magic, the Kabbalah magic. They followed what was recited to them by the shayateen, whatever shaytan taught them. They were thinking it's the angels. But in fact, it is not the angels, it is the shayateen. And this is how this passage links with the passage before it that's talking about the angels. And this passage itself mentions two of the angels, as you'll see. And they followed what was recited to them, taught to them by the shayateen regarding the kingdom of Sulaiman. Uh, one day I might do this, but all of these secret societies, they take their information back to the kingdom of Sulaiman like the Freemasons, the Illuminati, all of this, okay? So they all go back to Prophet Sulaiman Maybe one day I'll show that to you guys. وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman And Sulaiman was not the one who did kufr, no. وَلَكِنَّ الشَّيَاطِينَ كَفَرُوا The kufr came out of the shayateen, okay? And يُعَلِّمُونَ النَّاسَ السِّحْرِ And they would teach, who would teach? the These shayateen would teach the people magic. And Allah says, وَمَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِ لَهَا رُوتَ وَمَا رُوتَ and, uh, and what we sent down of the two angels in Babylon. Okay, now Babylon, keep this as the place, okay, where all of this Kabbalah magic starts. You'll see this. وَمَا And regarding what? مَا أُنزِلَ عَلَى الْمَلَكَيْنِ بِبَابِ اللَّهِ هَارُوتَ وَمَارُوتَ The two angels, Harut and Marut, that came down. وَمَا يُعَلِّمَانِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ And they would not teach anyone. 
حتى يقول إنما نحن فتنة. Look, we are a test for you. What is the test? They came down because people were doing so much magic that it was hard to see what is a prophet doing, what is a false prophet doing. So the angels came down to teach them, look, this is how you can tell it's the unseen world of the jinns doing this or the unseen world of the angels doing this. And how would you know that? Well, that is a longer discussion I'll have one day. <clears throat> but let's just continue. So they would teach people how to know the difference between prophetic miracles versus the magic of the shayateen and the jinns. فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مِنْهُمَا مَا يُفَرِّقُونَ بِهِ بَيْنَ الْمَرْعِ وَزَوْجِ And they would teach them that thing that would be able to divide the husband from the wife. As you know, the most common form of what? Magic is the division between husband and wife. And if any husband and wife have a problem, they should recite this ayah number 102 continuously for like 10 hours, 12 hours straight. Both the husband and the wife together. Okay? This is a very, very powerful verse of the Qur'an. وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And they would not be able to cause hurt or harm to anyone except by the permission of Allah. Even magic, if it works, you know, it is by the permission of Allah. وَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ مَا يَضُرُّهُمْ وَلَا يَنْفَعُهُمْ And they would teach the people and they would do magic that would hurt them and not benefit them. وَلَقَدْ عَلِمُوا and they knew. They knew after this. They knew whoever purchases this, meaning magic, and this relationship. There is no portion for them in the next world. And what an evil thing is that they've sold themselves for. Only if they did truly but did but know. Okay? So now, let me just go back to what I was saying. So, Kabbalah is the magic specifically to bring back the Messiah. And it specifically comes in a spiritual garb, pretending to be angelic. And connecting you with the mystical part of Judaism. And connecting you with the angels. But they're not angels, they're jinns. Okay? And... Uh, Magic, the black magic, is any magic that is done, that is what? That is done with any jinns, with any magician. Now, uh, there is, now let me go over here and share this with you, inshallah, a visual guide to the demons that spooked the Jews of Babylon. Now, in the previous verse that we just read, we read the angels came down to where? To Babylon. Okay? And Babylon was a place of magic. And so these are some of the shayateen, you can say the jinns, the things that spooked them, right? A, and this is in the uh, Israeli newspaper called Haritz. A new study depicts for the first time what Lilith, the baby-killing seductress, looked like to those who feared her and why Satan has a tail and horns. Okay, so Satan has tail and horns. These are the pictures that these people had drawn at this uh, particular time. And I'll, so these are the, some of their things. And then they, you know, go over these uh, magical amulets that they had. Now you can see here a man with one eye, right? Uh, one eye guy. And then if you go, you'll see some of these other things uh, that they had. Uh, So these are some of the, so this is like the shaitan with the horns and with the tail. Okay, uh, here's another man with a blind eye, right? So anyway, this gives you an idea of the type of things that were happening in Babylon. And so they had a hard time to tell which was uh, from, uh, so, so there was a lot of connection between uh, Babylon and magic. And this is where the angels came down. And so, in order to make themselves look good when they're doing this magic, the Kabbalah magic, they always take it back to the angels because it started with the angels, Harut and Marut. But they give these angels other names that are well known, like Jibra'il and Mikail and so on and so forth. 
So you, if you look over here in Kabbalah also, uh, you'll find, you know, the uh, this was the biblical period, the, ret uh, the biblical return from Babylon in the second temple of Judaism, shifting to a, uh, a canonization and exegesis of the scripture after Ezra the scribe. Basically, uh, what it's trying to say, uh, early Jewish literature, which is Kabbalah, right? It all formed in this place called Babylon. Uh, I'll show you a few more things about this. So what's behind the Hollywood's fascination with Kabbalah? Okay, so Hollywood is specifically interested in programming us for the coming of the Messiah and to be able to use these people. And, you know, when they do this magic, these people are desperate for their careers. They want to look uh, dazzling, right? Zinatul Hayat dunya They want to be famous. So all these things are given to these people that come to Hollywood with nothing. And then all of a sudden they have these big jobs and they have to sell themselves a lot of times to maintain themselves, right? And so let me just show you, for example. Okay, so uh, one of the things is that they wear all of these people, okay, is what it's saying, but it is. And then you'll see these... Uh, so you'll see these famous people uh, wearing these uh, red uh, bracelets, right? Uh, and these, this is a, a specific Kabbalah prayer that has to do with the angels, which I'll show you in a second. So you have this lady over here, right? Uh, you have pol pol politicians wearing this. You have other, you know, actors and actresses all wearing this, right? Uh, and so I can go on and on in this, right? So you have this thing here. Uh, again, that's that. So that's that. And uh, so now, what is this red thing, for example? Uh, you see, over here, I want to mention, uh, this is the practical Kabbalah and the Jewish tradition of magic, right? So this is just to establish that point. Uh, when mysticism becomes science, I'm not going to go over this right now. Traditionally, Jewish thinkers were divided into two categories, philosophers and mystics. Um, and then I want to go over this bracelet, uh, the origins of Kabbalah, which of course have to do with what? Uh, Babylon, what this uh, verse of the Quran talks about. Uh, okay, and so it was in Babylon that uh, all of this manifested, okay, and happened. And uh, so this red bracelet that I was talking about is the red Kabbalah bracelet. Okay, just keep this in mind. And, uh, but you'll see this has manifestations in many other religions at the same time. Okay, and so what is the meaning of this red bracelet? Okay, uh, and so... Uh, it is this prayer, uh, but before I go there, uh, let me show you this. So this red bracelet is also there in the Chinese tradition, okay? It's there in the Japanese and in the Hindu tradition, you probably remember the sisters put this on their brothers also. It's also in the Hindu tradition, This specifically this red uh, string or bracelet that they wear, okay? Now, let me, I was trying to show you uh, the bracelet prayer, okay? The, br the bracelet prayer is the Kabbalistic red string, uh, whatever you want to call it, I don't even want to take the name, protection prayer, that is recited, that invokes the four archangels, Mikael, Jibrail, etc., Uriel, and etc., etc. These are all shayateen and stuff for Allah. Okay, but it, they name them with the names of the angels, but in fact, they're just what? Shayateen. That's how they garb the, uh, the Satanism in the garb of spirituality. Okay, so now uh, let me just further continue. So I will maybe come back to this later. So as a result, if you go to the Jewish uh, virtual library, let me just mention this. Among the Jewish sects, the doctrine of the angels was not evenly spread amongst various parts of the Jewish people. So certain people liked certain Jewish tribes, like certain tribe, certain angels, and another group liked another angels. 
And when actually Umar bin Khattab an, when he first time heard about this, that wait, why do Jews like uh, certain angels and not like certain angels? This doesn't make sense from the perspective that they're both angels of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was actually very perturbed himself. The doctrine of angels was not evenly spread amongst the various parts of the Jewish people. The apocalyptic wisdom teachers imparted knowledge that they had secretly acquired through their contact with angels, meaning actually with contact with the shayateen. Only a narrow circle of specially initiated, consequently, the doctrine of the angels found its widest distribution among secret societies of etc etc okay uh and then uh you know the the main angel among the jewish magician sorcerers the concept of angels particularly confused influenced as they were by the pagan literature and then what when the angels usually appear in the company of pagan gods to combat disease, in some literary sources, biblical figures such as Suleiman were are mentioned as having been in possession of secret formulas or means by which they were able to induce religions to come to man's aid. And this is what And the shayateen recited to them, taught them things about the kingdom of Suleiman that were completely wrong. Right, and so uh, in this, the main angel that comes to the help of the Jewish people is Mikael, and they even though in the Quran Jibreel is the Amir of all the angels. So, yeah. So now you remember that verse where it talked about Jibreel والسلام, not being liked by the Jews. So in the Talmudic uh, literature, okay. Gabriel appears as Mikael's companions, okay? Uh, but perhaps his first connection to fire and lightning. Gabriel is occasionally portrayed as harsh and hard angel, okay? And so therefore he is... Uh, so Kabbalah adopted the figure of Gabriel and identified him with the emanation of judgment. And uh, just to give you an example of Jewish literature, how it portrays Gabriel in a negative way, so if you look here, Jibrail and the founding of Rome and what they say about Prophet Suleiman for example. So they say the Talmud credits Jibrail with setting the foundations of ancient Rome. This happened on the very same day that Suleiman married again, going back to Suleiman, the Egyptian princess. Although Suleiman's intentions were certainly good, his many marriages spiraled out of control, which is they always attack marriage. Prophet Muhammad's marriage with Aisha, they always attack marriages. You know, they always attack marriages. And that's why you know that uh, that they will tend to lie. Like even with, uh, just I'll, I'll leave this for another time. And ultimately led out to his downfall. Uh, in a poetic fashion, Suleiman built his first Jerusalem's temple and simultaneously sowed, sows the seeds of its destruction. For Rome would go on to destroy Jerusalem's temple for good, ushering an endless. So they said, oh, we don't like Jibreel, as it also comes in our tradition. Okay, And then they see Jibreel being harsh. And uh, of course, their main uh, angel is uh, Mikael, who actually, they when they get in touch with him, it's not Mikael, obviously, because uh, he's not a prof they're not a prophet. These rabbis are not prophets, or these people are not prophets. So it's the shayateen that's pretending to be angels in the garb of spirituality. Okay, and so over here, now, regarding uh, Mikael, right? So they have uh, certain, Mikael has certain attributes, that relates specifically to the Jewish people. Number one, Mikael is the only one in the Bible that Bible calls the archangel. Okay. Number two, Mikael stands guard over Israel. Number three, Mikael directly opposes Satan. Uh, Mikael only says four words in the Bible. Mikael is a military commander of some angels. Mikael battles the pat. Uh, battles the patron angels of other nations. So they believe other nations all have angels which is, of course, is a sign of, sign of shaitan, and Mikael battles them on behalf of Israel. Okay? And uh, so these are some aspects. And then, uh, finally, what I want to mention is, how does Kabbalah relate to uh, Islam? And, and probably a big part of the trick that will happen is as follows. Remember, 
those of you that have studied this issue in some detail will remember Ibn Siyad did not reject Prophet Muhammad, nor did Dijjal reject Prophet Muhammad as a prophet. And in the very future, when Hebrew becomes the international language of the world, about 30, 40 years from now, uh, the world will be very different. Okay, And uh, in the course of Prophet Muhammad's teaching in Mecca, okay, uh, and then this is a Jewish uh, organization that's writing this, many Madians converted to the faith of, of Prophet Muhammad, including many Jews. And then uh, Mark Cohen adds that Muhammad appeared centuries after the cessation of biblical prophecy, meaning 600 years after the after the Jibreel, uh, after Isa alayhi which also I want to mention that their, their distaste for Jibreel was partly, if you look at the Quran, Whenever Isa والسلام, is mentioned, and we strengthened him with Jibreel والسلام, is mentioned. And then Prophet Muhammad is also saying, Jibreel is coming to me. So that left a very negative taste uh, in the Jewish mind for Prophet, uh, for angel of Jibreel. Okay? And it was not their main angel. Okay? So in Judaism, prophets were seen as having attained the highest degree of holiness, scholarship, and closeness to God, okay? And uh, the Talmud reports that uh, there were prophets among the Gentiles. So these were non-Jewish Gentiles. Just like Ibn Sayyad, if you're not Jew, and if, you, if you're a Jew, you have to follow a Jewish prophet. And so here, the prophet Jonah was sent on a mission to speak to the Gentiles in the city of Nineveh. In the Middle Ages, it was common for Jewish writers to claim that Prophet Muhammad was a a madman, okay? a term of contempt frequently used in the Bible for those who believe themselves to be a prophet. Anyway, uh, uh, Maimonides alleges that Muhammad was a false prophet and an insane man. Just keep listening. In his epistles to Yemen, he wrote, after Jesus arose, uh, who, you know, he, Jesus was cursed, and so now, and he added for their objective to procuring rule and submission, and he invited uh, what was well known, okay, meaning to Islam, okay. In his authoritative work in Misna Torah, Moses Mennonites claims that nevertheless Muhammad was part of, part of God's plan for preparing the world for the coming of the Jewish Messiah. Okay, how? All those words of Jesus, Nazareth, and, and of this Ishmaelite who arose after him are only to make the straight path for the Masonic king and to prepare the whole world to serve the Lord together. Now, I hope you're able to connect this to Kabbalah. Okay? Why? Because these people were practicing Kabbalah. Uh, Moses, uh, Moses, uh, Memonides, was one of the people practicing Kabbalah. Okay, so now, so uh, Memonides and the Kabbalah. So you can see this, you know, and he's written uh, this thing for the perplexed people regarding Kabbalah. He wrote introduction to that. So just wanted to make that clear that as you're reading this, just like Ibn Siyad, he didn't deny Prophet Muhammad, but what happened in his authoritative work of law claims that nevertheless Muhammad was part of God's plan for preparing the world for the coming of the Jewish Messiah. All those words of Jesus of Nazareth and this Ishmaelite who arose after him are only to make this straight, this straight the path for the Masonic king to prepare the whole world to serve the Lord together. As it is said, for then I will change the speech, the language of the peoples to a pure speech, meaning Hebrew or whatever it is. So that, And this is when, like English, Hebrew may be the main language at that time about 20, 30 years from now, so that all of them shall call on his name of the Lord and serve him in one accord. Okay, And a prominent uh, Yemeni rabbi and theologian and the founder of what is called Jewish Ismailism wrote in his philosophical treatise, treatise Bustan al-Aqul, the Garden of Intelligence, uh, that God sends prophets to establish religions for other nations which do not have to conform to the precepts of Jewish Torah, 
uh, uh, Nitalin explicitly considered Muhammad a true prophet who was sent from heaven with a particular message that applies to Arabs but not to the Jews. A proof that God sends a prophet to every people according to their language is found in this passage of the Quran. Consequently, had God sent a prophet to the Jews, he would have certainly have sent it in, in the Jewish language. And Fahmi's explicit acceptance of Muhammad's prophecy was rare and virtually unknown until recent times beyond the native uh, Yemeni, Yemeni, Yemeni Jews. Okay, so what what is it that I'm trying to say here? I'm trying to say here that uh, the as we know, the Jal and Ibn Sayyad and this whole tradition accepts Prophet Muhammad as a prophet. And so when the Jal comes out, he's not going to deny Prophet Muhammad as a prophet. And when the Jal comes out, he is he's, he's going to in fact infer, confirm Muhammad is a prophet, and in fact say he is the prophet of the Arabs, and this will be easy to sell to the Muslims <coughs> at that time, because it's not going to ask them to necessarily change their religion, but will ask them to add on to their religion certain things, right? Meaning it will cause them to change their religion, I'm sorry. But what I meant is from the perspective of that time, Muslims may not feel like it's, oh yeah, he agrees that Prophet Muhammad is a prophet. And he will probably quote Prophet Muhammad. And he will probably come in a garb of spirituality. And he will probably claim it's the angels that are helping him. Right? Just like when Jibra, uh, Isa a.s. comes down, he will come down with a group of angels. When the Messiah, the false Messiah comes down, he'll also be coming down with what will be looking like a group of angels, but it will actually be jinns. And so the difference between black magic is black magic is general magic with any shaitan. But Kabbalah magic is magic that is preparing the way for the Messiah. And it starts uh, even, meaning it starts before Prophet Muhammad's time, but it was there. Kabbalah magic was there in Medina. Uh, prior to the Prophet, during the Prophet's lifetime, and it has continued till today. Okay, and its specific mission is to straighten the way for the coming of the Messiah. And the Jews and the religious Jews of the future, uh, they're not going to deny Prophet Muhammad is a prophet. They're going to say, yeah, he was, he was a prophet, but he's just not our prophet. And uh, and he's your prophet, he's not our prophet. He's the, he's the prophet of the house of Ismail, as they say. He's the prophet of the house of Ismail, and uh, he's not our prophet. And uh, so these celebrities, whatever they're doing, right, uh, they're all preparing the way using Kabbalah. And I think I showed you the prayer where they call upon the angels. Why? So in the ayah, the first thing that is made clear, the shayateen, that type of the jinn, corrupted the idea of the mulk of Suleiman. So what they want, what their target, is a kingdom like Suleiman right? Perhaps maybe part of it is that they felt humiliated, that this human being had control over them. And now they want to like, uh, you know, that's what you become, uh, you know, what you, what captures your imagination in a sense. And so they want another kingdom like Suleiman And so when Suleiman saw that, Jasad on his kursi, right? That was a sign of that. And that is when Suleiman prayed to Allah that give me a, a mulk, a kingship that no one has ever had. And anyway, the point being that the shayateen corrupting the true message of the Prophet, specifically of Suleiman. Number two, their target is the kingdom of Suleiman. What do they, why do they give them wrong information about the kingdom of Suleiman? Because they want to create their own kingdom on their own terms. And then they have this idea that, you know, we are connecting to the angels when in fact they're connecting to the jinns. And Allah mentions specifically two angels. Why? To say, the angels that talk to human beings, that came to teach human beings, were Harut and Marut. Not those angels that you pray to when you wear your red uh, bracelet. You're praying to Mikael and Jibrail and, and I don't know what the name of the other angels are. And so, uh, this verse of the Quran is very amazing. And then it tells us that they sell themselves, right? They sell themselves. 
And so this is what the magician does. He, he, he sell, when you sell yourself, you put your, it's a contract, selling and buying. You give me this, I'll give you this, and then there's a written contract called the receipt. So there's, a, there's this contract that happens. And so the enemies of humanity, the shayateen, they want to establish a order on the world that is in their view what it should be. And they will be, they're controlled. The, the angels that come, that, there's no angels that are talking to them. Okay. On the one side, they say we don't like certain angels, as we mentioned, and they say they like certain others. And then on the other side, when it comes to this, this mysticism in the spiritual garb, right, uh, makes them do some good things and then some evil things. But the evil things are done to reach their objectives, right? And so uh, I will just end here for this, inshallah. And just as, um, so this is the Kabbalistic red, red string. You know, the red string I was showing you earlier, the prayer, the protection prayer. Leaving the home, they pray for the four angels, which is actually the shayateen, etc., etc. Being Mikael, Jibrail, Uriel, uh, Razvail, Well, whatever their names are, Astaghfirullah and al And so this is what they, you know, do. Why the angels? Because ultimately this false religion of Dajjal has to be garbed in some sort of spirituality. So I wanted to shed some light on this issue. And I hope inshallah you found it interesting. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum.